A little bit of a different video today. Today we won't be hopping straight into a part in Mashcam. What we're doing today is an interview and we're going to be interviewing what I would consider to be an expert in five axis machining in Mastercam. This is not someone you've probably come across before in your social media travels. You won't see him posting on Instagram. Most likely you won't see anything from him on Facebook or YouTube either, as far as machining goes. So luckily enough for us, we've got some time spent today with Mr. Ron Branch of Fifth Axis Programming. And this first half video here, talk about all sorts of things, you know, strategies, attitude, stuff like that as far as uh, machining goes. And then part two will come a little bit later. And that is going to be an actual Mastercam file that Ron's prepared for us. And he's going to walk us through some tips and strategies, just overall efficiencies in Mastercam and programming in general, and some ideas that you can take to improve your Mastercam programming. Before we start, I don't know, let's go through, you know, who you are, what you do. Kind of okay. what you do, I guess the, the the elevator pitch, kind of what I do instead of you know, exactly what you do, but uh, yeah, just kind of your name, your company, and kind of what you guys do, and and we'll go from and then we'll hop into your screen share if you don't mind. Yeah, so uh, Ron Branch, uh, Vice President of Fifth Axis CD Incorporated here in Southern California, and uh, we do consulting for manufacturing. Uh, we are a C corporation registered in State California, which was required as part of their whole process to be able to do this for uh, consulting. And uh, we do project for a lot of different companies, a lot of different uh, machines, industries and such. Um, a lot of the companies we do work for, I'm under NDA, so I'm not uh, allowed to say the company names, but we've put stuff in space, we've put stuff on automobiles, we've put stuff uh, in medical devices, implants, um, there's a lot of industries that we've been involved with that we've touched over the years that um, I'm humbled to have the opportunity to have ever really done. And uh, we don't advertise. I had, do have a website and I've had a website for a long time, but I'm not a um, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. I, I do the eMastercam form for a lot of my uh, stuff, but I'm real low key. Mm -hmm. I don't care to, get out there and toot my horn and talk about how great I am because I'm just a guy trying to earn a living just like anybody else. So I don't really try to um, go shake, shake the rafters like a lot of guys do or put my picture out there. And it, you know, it's, I'm kind of not really comfortable doing this, but <laughs> you and I talked about it. And so I agreed to it and I, I want to help manufacturing. And I think that's what's yeah. missing with a lot of different uh, people and organizations is it's all about them. It's all about what they can get out of the equation. And the more we help each other and the more we do for each other, and the more knowledge we share, the better we all are. And that was something I thought coming up through the trades was I was the nerd. I was the computer guy. I was always the outcast, it seemed like. And it, it was hard sometimes because, I mean, you know, you're coming up in the shop and you're getting cussed at and spit on and <laughs> yeah. things like that because you're trying, because you're asking questions, because you're eager yep. to learn. That's what it was like for me coming up through the trade was a lot of disrespect, a lot of different things. And yeah, I was a, a your arrogant kid who mm -hmm. knew it all. I mean, I was dumb, but I was, I was eager. I was willing. I would, I would, I would try. I wouldn't just try one time and fail and quit. I always tried. And, and that was the thing that as I, as I started doing this and started learning, I became more and more knowledgeable. And it was kind of sad because I don't have a degree. I'm not college material. I, I, I tried to go to college, but after six times of taking a college English class and couldn't get it aligned, mm -hmm. okay, this isn't my thing. Yeah. But I'm not stupid. And I think that's really kind of the, the issue with manufacturing is it gets painted wrongly. It gets this bad aura of about what we do and what we're about. I mean, I'm in my house. I'm working from my home. I've done this now for almost a decade, working out of my house. I mean, I've been on site for customers, been around the world, uh, doing different things, taking my family with me and such. And that's a blessing. I'm thankful to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But it's not the dirty, you know, dingy, you know, terrible job that so many people think it is. Yeah. And you now when I took trade school back in the 90s, 
actually earlier than that, the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> when I took trade school in the late eighties, we didn't have CNCs. You know, I I did yeah. CNC on paper. I did it for local shops. To, that's kind of my that was my way to hey learn. And then once I got out in the workforce and started doing it, yeah, I just started progressing with it. And I started picking up books and reading and learning and, and, and investigating and taking my own time and doing this. And that's the thing I see missing today with a lot of people getting in a trade is everybody wants it easy. Everybody wants mm-hmm. to be able to kind of take it and push a button or everybody wants to be able to, you know, just take this thing and put it up to the screen and have it make a part. Yeah. If only, right. It don't work that way. It takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of um, patience. It takes a lot of fortitude. I mean, it, there's times, I mean, <laughs> I'm scratching my head. I'm beating my head. I'm like, man, what, <laughs> yeah. why can't I get this to work? But I just don't quit. I just don't, well, that, okay, I'm done. Okay, I, I can't do it. No. Yeah. People are depending on Uh-oh. the person to go to. Oh, and I you. pride myself on trying to be that person. Not, you know, nobody's perfect. Anybody thinks they're perfect. Well, you know, I, as a boss, that was two people I never hired. I never hired somebody who was perfect and somebody knew it all. Because... Especially in the machining world, right? If you say you've never <laughs> made a mistake in the machining world, you are lying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know. It I, happens I, all I, the time. I, well, it shouldn't happen all the time, but. Well, it happens quite a bit. I mean, I customer does. day, they're, they're running a five axis on a, on a Kuma. And I did a program for him some time ago. And now they're finally getting up and running. And he's like, yeah, man, I trust your program. And I can let it run. And, you know, walk away for 30 minutes. I said, dude. Until it's proven, mm-hmm. it can crash. Yes. There is no guarantees. You have no idea. Well, I try, I, I'm just telling you, I am not giving you permission to run this. <laughs> and that's really kind of that whole transition of where accountability comes in for our methods and our processes. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, everybody kind of goes, well, where is it all tied together? Well, it, it all ties together every part of it. When we put a, a drill bit in a machine, I don't know how many times people haven't checked the drill bit and put it in the machine and then drilled a hole wrong. Yeah. Why didn't you check the drill bit? Well, I, I, I grabbed it out of the drill tray. Well, did you check it? Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't think I knew. <laughs> did you check it? Yeah. If you didn't check it, then the results of what happened are your responsibility, not mine, not anybody else's. You didn't take the simple basic time to stop and check that drill bit. Yeah. And it's all relative to everything we do as part of just programming. And what I do, you know, I have liability insurances and I have so many different aspects to what I do Mm -hmm. that I just can't give somebody a program and say, here, I hope it works. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm pulling for you. No, (laughs) it has to be a, a methodical process and it has to, it has to work. So I didn't plan on getting on this. You know, I, I, I was running a shop back in Florida and um, 9-11 happened. And yeah, I was like, man, you know, I'm worried. so I'll go find a job. And so I went and did so a programming job. That's how you got into to consulting is I'm going to wait to figure your screen to unfreeze and then I'll, I'll finish asking the question. Hold on. 9-11 happened and the oh, owner was like, oh, what are we going to do? And I said, I-, I trained all the guys, keep them. I'll go find a job. So I, I left my position. I was running the company. It was, I was, you know, it was my shop, but I said, no, I'm, I'm going to go find a job. You keep everybody else. And so I uh, quit the job and went and found a, a contract job for five axis programming. Mm-hmm. I'd done multi-axis before, but not five axis. And they had master cam and I'd been using it for some time before that. Yeah. And I came in and got more done in one day and it got done in three months. <laughs> and they're like, whoa, I'm like, you know, it's just basics. I mean, it's, once you understand the basics, and that's really what it was, it was just basic stuff. Somebody wasn't doing it right. So I broke it down to basics, worked through it. And then they had a post and the post was working and they're like, oh, what about, uh. so I tried reaching out to the, to the vendor and they, they couldn't help us. And so Jim Gamble, the dealer there in Florida was like, Hey, Ron, we've got this near five X post. We'll give it to you. Have here's the PDF for it. Figure it out. I had a little bit of computer, I had a lot of computer, language at the time. It's like, oh, I'll take, I dive into it. And within a month, I had a fully working post with all the miscellaneous energy, potential factors, all the, everything, every switch that machine could do, I had it all dialed in the post. Nice. And I started running full five axis molds and everything else. I, I mean, with no problem. And everybody's like, 
how is this possible? Well, it's math. I mean, as long as you understand the mathematical process, that's really all we do. Yeah, yeah. It's all basic math. And, yeah. you know, there's, there's some complexity to that math at times. But I was doing coloring, surface machining with pencil and paper long before I ever had a cam system. I was doing four axis roll dies and mapping everything out to 360 degree increments and then down to minutes and seconds to come up with the perfect tangential intersection of that tool to do roll dies with pencil and paper. Right. So and I think that's another aspect of what is missing in our trade is that foundational learning, that foundational, you know, I, I back in trade school, I had to sharpen my own tool bits. I had to, you know, set up, my, try my own head in. I had to go cut my own threads and I had to cut them off and then cut left hand threads on there. And, uh, I remember the first thing I did was get a hacksaw and I had to go make a one inch block, a perfect one inch block. You know, I, I yeah. I'll show you this. <laughs> this is my gear. Yeah that I made in 1988. Oh, look at that. <laughs> old, uh, you know, indexing head. Yeah, the we indexing heads, yeah. Yeah, I had to lay out the gears and everything. Yeah. And I still have it. You know, my dad's got a star that I cut by hand with a hacksaw and I had to do it by hand. I had to lay it out, scrap it all out and do it. And then a one inch block was the other requirement. But just something like this, a fundamental idea of being able to understand how to do this by hand yeah, it's lost in most shops today. How would you understand? And I, I explained it several people over years. Like you get to an odd number of gears, how do you come up with the stack error? How do you know how far out the decimal equation needs to be to properly accommodate mm -hmm. stack error? No, well, that's a camp software. I should do it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right, it's, it's a servo fourth uh, axis and, and a camp software. We don't need to know the stuff. So let's, yeah. But yeah, they, they are missing. You, a lot of programs now they're missing out the basics sharpening a drill by hand is 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 one that's definitely getting lost uh, because there is the argument that yeah, especially in higher production shops you know you shouldn't be regrinding a drill you should just be buying a new tip or you should be buying a new drill and, and you send that stuff out to get ground and it's ground way better than you could ever do by hand which yeah that's true but you're missing that nuance of the of the skill of the trade right that th those little things that all those little things add up to a bigger thing and just knowledge of the trade and how things work and how things are all tied together. Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of, that's kind of the whole aspect of, you know, like master cam. And, and I think that's, you know, I feel, I feel very blessed to be able to even know what I know and do what I can do, but I didn't get this overnight. I've been doing this for over 30 years, almost 35 years now. Yeah. And I'm still learning. I don't know everything. I can't know everything. I mean, it's too much. All, you know, I was helping a customer today with a five axis machine and, you know, code I've run on 30 other machines on this particular machine needs to have the clamp and unclamp before the G43-4. Yeah. That was causing the machine to go into this infinite loop of not running and everybody scratched their head and they're like, well, we can't tell you why, but on this particular machine that needs to happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. No big deal. Kill switch. Okay. But they're all like, right. I never heard of it either before. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know why, but yeah. Okay. But that, that's a good point right there. So that was a problem that you hadn't faced before. And if you hadn't learned a basic skill, uh, you probably wouldn't have never been able to troubleshoot that problem. And that basic skill would be just learning how to read G code. Yeah. So a lot of kids, I don't want to learn to read G code. The post makes it all and it's, it's fine. It works every time. So why do I want to learn what a G zero five is? And that's hundred percent. Why? Right, right there. Yeah, it's all fundamentals. And, and, and that's why I also like helping uh, the next generation come up as well, because there's so much to what we do. And there's so much about what we have to do that we take a lot of it for granted. We don't remember why do I do this? You know, yeah. what's the reason for this? You know, and whenever you have an acquisitive, uh, eager person, I like it because it challenges me to remember why do I do it this way? <laughs> yeah. You know, what's the reason for it? You know, what, you know, it's like you said, that drill bit, if you don't understand, you know, the relief angle and the zero point uh, cutting edge and relieving the web. And, you know, if you could have a little back relief on there, if you put a little bit of uh, like on brass, if you actually reverse grind a little bit, so it's actually a negative cutting, it'll cut better. And people, that don't make any sense. Well, I realize it doesn't make sense, but in <laughs> brass, this is yeah. one of those things you have to do and it helps and it works. And, and those are the 
the nuanced things of what we do that a lot of people miss. And that's where the basics get just, well, I just want to be a five X programmer. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. What have you done before? Well, I, I, I've, um, I read a book. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah. What have you done? Well, how have you prepared yourself to be a five X programmer? What do you know about speeds and fees? What do you know about tooling? What do you know about work holding? What do you know about all the different aspects that go into five axis programming? Five axis programming is not like super, super difficult at times, but at times it can be extremely complex. I mean, yeah. there's times when I'm challenged in ways that it's just, you know, I, what do we do? How, how, you have to stop. Yeah, even like you and said, even though you've got one proven method that works on machine A, uh, that may not work on machine B. Uh, and you've got to be able to adapt that to a different style of programming, different programming method, different tool, whatever it is to make it work on that type of machine. Uh, and, even though that, yeah, you've done it a million times before the other way. And, and the other thing is, is, is so many people don't understand kinematic awareness and having, I've, my wife tells me I'm crazy, but I can look at a part, I can build it in my head. And then I can also build the machine in my head. I can look at the tool, I can look at the process, I can look and I do it at the point now where, I mean, I look at a part and as we're talking, I was talking to, I was doing a meeting yesterday, pre-plan meeting, and it's a, a, a legacy rocket part. Mm -hmm. And um, they did it a certain way for years and now they wanna go to a, a newer machining center and the previous 22 operations and now want to bring down the four, which, yeah, makes perfect sense. Let's use modern technology, modern methods. Mm -hmm. But they hadn't really thought about some of the things. And so as we're having this conversation, I'm like, well, have you thought about this? Well, no. Well, that's important. You know, if, it's, if we're going to move all this material off here, this thing's going to, you know, it's going to go three ways a Sunday. So we need to think about how much movement we're allowing as part of that process. Now, yeah. And that's what happens sometimes in this trade is we've done it this way for so long and I'm happy people want to change, but they go too far too quick. And yeah. Okay. Some parts they don't realize as part of what they've done for so long has actually helped them to manufacture the part, you know, like a titanium part. You have a, a part we did for a customer years ago and it was a, a big giant forging and it had just tons of material coming off of it and they would do it in stages. So they would rough it. They would normally it'd sit over here for a week while they went through all the parts in the stage. And then it go, they go through all these parts in the stage. And when we came in, I said, I think this thing's going to move. Oh no, 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 we'll be fine. Look, I really think this part is going to, I think it needs to go through a normalization process. I think we need to right. rough it in. So you're talking, just to clarify, you're talking stretch relieving as you're machining this part and it's, it's then shifting after the fact. And then you got to come back in and, and do a semi-finish, finish type op. Well, the way they were doing it is they were actually stress relieving it because it was sitting around for so long. So when you did step one, the, the first part sat for a week before you got to step two. Right. Okay. Whereas when you went from uh, rough to finish in the same setup, same operation in eight hours, mm -hmm. that's a whole different animal and materials. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the other aspect of what we do that I think people forget is we have to think about physics. We have to think about elasticity. We have to think about plasticity. We have to think about a metallurgy, we have to think about stresses and- The metallurgy course, class that everybody hates. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. I mean, yeah. it's just part of machining. It's part of what we do. And if we don't think about that and counteract those effects, you know, that dynamic tool paths, uh, the high speed tricodal, that, that does, a, I mean, it's phenomenal what they do and how they work, but they're not the end all in some applications for a process. And that's where a lot of people Oh, let's go program a part. That's great. What's your process? What do you mean? Well, <laughs> machine a part. Okay. Is it is a is a block with four holes in it? Okay, great. Who cares? But is it gonna be heat treated? Is it gonna be stress relieved? Is it gonna have coating? Is it gonna is there bearing fits? Are there seal fits? Are there threads? Are there 
uh, uh, burr aspects or, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. all these different things that are related to the manufacturing. It's not just a program. And the software that we use is just a tool as part of the manufacturing. You know, right. it takes it takes every aspect, the machine, the machinist, the setup, the tooling, the, it brings it all together and allows us to cohesively make something. You know, I, I've always told everybody, I feel I'm, a, I feel I'm an artist because I'm taking mm -hmm. and I've, I've made people mad over the years because I'm like, no, I want, I want this to be perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take my time and I'm going to come around that edge perfectly and I'm going to blend this and I'm, I'm going to make sure this edge gets broke and you know, and, and I, I was doing it for a, a manifold years ago for a customer. They had this lip that came up uh, to a flange and it was a knife edge. And I said, well, I can be burnt. And they're like, no, you, we'll do it by hand. I said, no, 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 let's mm -hmm. do it on the machine. Well, why would you do that? Well, because it's a 10,000 radius max on a really critical area. And why not let the machine do all the work for you so you don't run the risk of deep burn and dinging the part and everything where it sits and, and yeah, yeah. You know, kind of obviously, but it was like, you, you thought I was starting a war over it. It's like, <laughs> goes along with, you see advancements, you see things being done, but even that basic idea of deburner part sometimes is lost, you know, breaking mm -hmm. an edge. Uh, can you roll the race a little better? And I, I think that's the hard part for like a contractor is the nuances inside of a shop. Almost every place has some kind of travel knowledge. And as much as everybody wants to put ISO and AS9100 and all these different aspects into their manufacturing and their processes, there's still a lot of tribal knowledge in a lot of places that we run into. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to break down is, okay, why? And what do you mean? What do you mean why? Why do you want to do it this way? Plus, why you always come? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's always that's the worst answer ever, right? Well, I mean, it's always been done. Yeah. And and, <laughs> and I mean, I I did a I did a project for a customer, and it was uh, broaching on the machine. And this has been in the last year or so, and uh, I never done it that way before. And they're like, "Will it work?" I'm like, "Yeah, it'll work." And they're like, "No, it won't." <laughs> yeah, it will. And but because. I've done this for so long. I, I've done it. I've, 25 years ago, I was broaching on a machine. So for me, it's like, yeah, okay, no big deal. I mean, I had to do it, figure it out. And I figured it out. And they were like, well, we're not sure. So boom, it was a whole process. It took a whole, a lot of back and forth and a lot of different groups working together. But when we were done, it came out within a thousandth of an inch of where we expected it to be. Now, I, didn't ex I didn't honestly expect it to be that perfect, <laughs> but it, it was that perfect. It was within a thousandth of an inch. And I was like, well, that's pretty good. That's kind of what we were hoping for, right? Nice. Yeah. And it, it took, you know, this experience and that knowledge and this little bit here and, and something I did there. And, and, and that's what experience is that's missing, I think, in a lot of the education that people get degrees in is I've equated to like skiing. I tried to learn how to ski. I am no skier. I'm just, I've learned that. I'm, no, I'm not a skier. My kids, they're great at me. No. <laughs> but I was taking this lesson from this guy and he said, the Eskimos have 20 words for snow. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, there's 20 different types of words they have just for snow. That's how different the snow is. And I got to think about it and I started equating to what we do. And, you know, I appreciate anybody who goes to college and do a degree. I think that is uh, just awesome. To say you have to have a degree to do what we do, I think is a misnomer. And I think it really sets a bad precedent for everyone to, to think, well, for you to be successful in this, you have, you have, no, you don't have to, you have to have willingness. You have to have um, what I call umption and gumption, where you're, yeah. you're willing to go do it and you're willing to put in the time to learn it. But anybody can do what we do. Anybody can learn this if they are willing to humble themselves and learn it. There's a, and, yeah, there's a level of, of effort that needs to be put forth to get to th that level. And, you know, like, I'm sure my printer just kicked on there. To get to that level in 5-axis Pro Mega, you can't just say, yeah, I, I can do this. And there, some shop's going to say, yeah, okay, go ahead. There's that uh, $2 million machine. Hop on it. Have at it. You know, if it crashes, uh, that's fine. Whatever. You tried. No, no, no. That doesn't. Yeah, there's some. 
believe effort it or not, and some yeah. some some uh, some trails to be broken before you'd be allowed into that machine, right? So uh, I've seen it. I've seen shops buy you know those two million dollar pieces of equipment and then go throw a you know a newbie on it and go, well, why ain't this working? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a reason why. Yeah. You know, there is um, you know, I, the different aspects related to just work holding, just just everything when you do, and that's part of that process. But you know, I was as I was saying about the skiing is you can read books and you can watch videos and you can YouTube this and YouTube that and do whatever you want to know about skiing. But until you get those skis on your feet mm -hmm. and you get on the snow and you've gone to all these different snow locations and then all these different things and experience all these, you can't really call yourself a world-class skier. Yeah. Until you've done, if you've been on the kitty slope at, you know, wherever, they don't call, you're not a you're not a professional skier you're you're a kitty skier yeah. and i think that's what's missing with a lot of people who get degrees is they have the theory they have the book smarts they have and they're smart people very intelligent but they don't have the experience to really understand how to what what the practical application is just because it looks good on paper just because you've seen a youtube video doing this or doing that okay, what were the perfect, you know, what was the, there's all so many different nuances or things to it. It's not just, hey, you know, what was it? the I stayed at Holiday Inn last night and I'm an expert. I mean, I, that was the, yep. the commercial or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you can even put that on the, uh, the thing. because All we, good. <laughs> all good. But um, it, that's, that's where I think, you know, I was talking to somebody today about this and uh, he said, yeah, he says, man, he says, I, I've worked with him for, for six years now and uh, we've worked together and, and he, he's, he's first one to say, you know, he says, man, we're, we're always learning, you know, and I respect, mm -hmm. I respect his talent tremendously. And I know other people, I respect their talents tremendously, but they're like me. They're like, man, <laughs> we're all learning. I, you know, I mean, yeah, it's not like, you know, this is like, Hey, wave a magic wand and okay, you're a five axis programmer. You know everything. Really? Come on. Yeah, this this still is a practical trade, and it will always be a practical trade. You have to have time on the machines to be able to say, well, even just to be able to do it. And then the old saying, "You don't know what you don't know," that, that applies to this. You can training is one step. It's a step in the right direction, whether that's training through, you know, stuff like what we do or whether yep. it's training where you go to a university or college or whatever, and whatever you specialize in, that's like step one. So you've got an understanding of some fundamentals. Uh, you still need to go and now apply them and do something and go through the process of trying to cut something, especially the parts that you get in manufacturing are not always engineered to be manufactured easily. Um, engineers, it's the same, it's the same process. They're learning as well. And a lot of the younger ones, maybe even the older ones too, that just don't know, don't realize that, you know, if you've got a six inch deep pocket, you know, an eighth inch radius in the corner is not an easy thing to make. Uh, is it possible? Sure. But it's going to cost you a lot of money. And we you know where the a one inch radius would have worked just the same. So it's little things like that. It's a learning process for everybody on both sides of the field, engineers versus machinists the ongoing battle, but uh, we, it's all a process. Um, you've got to get some theory education in there. You need to know the basics, the principles, and then, yeah, to be able to call yourself the master, like you said, you need to have actually done it and done it uh, at every level along the way. It's a process from the baby hill, like you said, up to the, the world-class ski race downhill. Uh, yeah. You can't just yeah. jump from one to the other. You've got to progress up that scale. Uh, well, even even the best skiers fall, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and when they fall in those the bigger hills, it hurts you know, a lot they, more. They're, they're always, yeah, you know, and and that's part of the thing. Just doing this is something that um, you know. I, I was been in shops, and you know, I had I want to do what you do, and I'll ask them, okay, well, what what do you know about this machine? What do you mean? What are the G codes? What are the M codes in this machine? Have you picked up the book and read the alarm codes? Have you read the G and M codes in this machine? Do you understand this program you're running? Do you understand the tools that are cutting? Have you looked at speeds and fees? Have you printed out the program and started looking at how the program is laid out? What do you mean? <laughs> That's, you're setting this machine up and you don't even understand the basics of what you're setting up. You don't even know how to look at the, the speeds and fees of a tool that's cutting. I mean, I, I see you on your, you, you know, your, 
you're doing this and you know, you got your earbuds in, you know, that that's all great. But is that a video to help you learn what you're doing? You know? Yeah. Hey, I like my family. I love, you know, I like, I love my family (laughs) and I like to talk to people, but when I'm doing my job, that's my responsibility. And I've got to focus on that. If I want to be better at what I'm doing, I mean, when I, when I learned how to do wire EDM, I went in early, two hours early. I stayed two hours late for three months without pay. Three months. And everybody's like, well, what are you doing? You're just a brown noser. You're just, you're just, you're just, I, like, I want to learn. And this, I was told if I wanted to do it, that he would teach me. So, hey, that's how I learned. Well, three months later, I was put in charge of the EDM department. Yeah. And everybody's like, well, how'd you get that? Who you? So the Mm -hmm. three months that I put into that time Mm -hmm. was my investment, you know, coming home and, and, you know, picking up a master, taking a master cam key home maybe when I didn't have my own and um, learning and trying and and going on the forums and and some of my old kids, I see my kids and my wife more than ever did run a shop. And and I've had a hundred trinket working for me. I've had that stress of, you know, what's the overtime this week? And we're throwing a, a million dollars a year in overtime. And our maintenance costs are $1.2 million in our shop. And, you know, I've got machines breaking down every other day. And I've got so-and-so's out sick. And that was a hot project that we do. And we're going to have a penalty of $50,000 if we don't deliver this part. I've been there. And, you know, it's it's part of the manufacturing. But I, it's not like, hey, it, I sat out on this path. I didn't. You know, I got thrown into contract programming just because I had to feed my family. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, tried to work jobs and it's, you know, it it can be stressful at times. I mean, you know, I've got, I've got a lot of responsibility sometimes. I'm working for, you know, I can be a, you know, I have some multi-billion dollar corporations we do work for. And, um, you know, people's lives depend on some of what we do. I mean, stuff goes into space and people you know, are in those, you know, vehicles that we helped make parts for. And so it's, you know, it's like, Hey, okay, I'll just, you know, maybe that I I got a part right now. I've been working on for 10 months and um, you know, and everybody's like, man, that's a lot of work. Yeah. But I'm at the point now where I'm, I'm in Vericut and I'm seeing little services I don't like and I'm okay. I'm going to go back and redo this and okay, throw that away and do this. And, and, and it, by tolerance standards, it would be acceptable, but it's not my standards. Mm-hmm. And I look at the I look at the quality of what I'm producing, not necessarily the quality it'll pass inspection. And I think right. that's another thing that's different with a lot of programmers is, you know, I've gone to shops and I'm and I'm like, what are you doing? They're like, what? It's good stuff. Well, weren't you want it better than that? Mm-hmm. And that's something you can't teach someone. You you have to you have to innately have that in you that I want to do better. Yeah. You know, I can show you 10 ways to do something, but if step one is to it got it done, it's good enough, mm-hmm. then if that's all you care for, then you're not gonna you're not gonna care to get the step 10 and you know maybe back plot that tool path and save a vector out that'll drive that tool in perfectly here. Even though this was okay, it dragged down that wall and left a little, you know, a little bit of uh, deflection there. Well, you know, who cares? That's, that's, that's extra work. I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. We do. And, and that's, I don't know if there's a quantifier for that. I don't know how you would, you know, I've interviewed people for, you know, I've, I don't know, done so much, you know, and I, I, that's one of the questions I'll ask somebody. Well, what's your what's your thought about good enough how mm-hmm. good is good enough for you and if, man I, I if it takes me all night i'll okay i don't want you have a clock and i'm in a shop and i'm working with somebody trying to teach somebody five o'clock comes wrong they're gone and i'm like where'd they go yeah, oh, the five o'clock, mm-hmm. five o'clock buzzer. Dude, it works. Uh, we were right in the middle of this really important process on this particular part yeah. that you need to get done tomorrow, and you're gone. Yeah. You can't spend the next thirty minutes here, you know. And, and, and okay, 
it's here to get it done. I'll get it done. Get it, you know. And well, you're making the, you know, and, and I, I, something I hear all the time. That's why they pay you the big bucks. <laughs> no, this is why I earn the money that I charge. Yeah, fair and, enough. Yeah. You know, and it's like people go out and spend ridiculous amount of money on cars and people go out and spend ridiculous amount of money on whatever. For them, that is the value of that item. And if somebody doesn't like what I charge, they don't have to, you know, hey, this is my quote. This, this is what I quote. I'm very fair. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I did a project for somebody, a little aluminum thing, you know, I put them six hours, you know, I probably had 10 minutes, time was all said and done, but I know, I know my rate. I know, okay, to me it was fair, but you know, there are situations where I'll go on site and they're like, well, can you cut us a break? Well, are you, are you giving your work for free? Are you not charging your customers for work? <laughs> you know, I have to earn a living too. I don't have that dividend yeah. of continually making this part and making money off this part for the next five or 10 years that you do from my work. Yeah. I have to make what I'm going to make at this point in time for the next five or 10 years now. You're, you're taking and gaining from my experience and my knowledge of 30 mm-hmm. years to be able to take this and run this more efficiently. And I mean, I, I did a project for a customer uh, a few years ago and uh, it's a big giant hog out and everything. And that was roughly a hundred hours to rough this part. And I said, well, let's do it differently. Let's do this, do that. And I got down to 40 hours. Now they've made that part for the last six years mm-hmm. and they've made probably about 40 of them. So if you take that time savings of 60 hours, they didn't gain 60 hours. They've actually gained 120 hours per part. Yes. So if they run 60 parts at 120 hours and their shop rate would think was $315 an hour at the time. That's quite a bit of savings. It's big bucks. I, you know, I, I think I had, I think that was a, I think it was an 800 hour project. Time was all said and done. Time was starting to finish. But just, just on roughing, don't put anything else into the equation we did, mm-hmm. but just on roughing alone, that's a savings. And, and that's part of the other aspect that people don't look at in manufacturing is what is your actual cost? What does it actually take cost you to do this? And so I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Look, every hour you waste, you don't waste one hour, you waste two hours. Yep. That's an hour you can't put on something else. Yep. Every time you scrap a part, you don't lose the scrap part, you lost the replacement and you lost the time you could put on something else. Yep. So you, you really have three times the cost by not slowing down and doing it right the first time. So yeah, and, yeah, it is. It, it, that gets overlooked quite often. Is, is even though it's taking you a little bit more extra time, like your your programming of eight hundred hours was an investment for them in upfront time, but obviously paid off hugely uh, in in the long run. Uh, yeah, and that that goes across many different aspects of life. I think. Uh, well, it, it does. You know, I mean, if you're going to build a house. You know, if you want to bring in, um, you know, somebody that's uh, just getting started and, you know, I, I think I can build you a nice house. You know, I think I, can, think I can make it really nice for you. Just give me a chance to let me try to build you a nice house. Okay, cool. You know, go build me a house. And, you know, the walls are crooked and it's leaking, you know, <laughs> and it's, the roof's leaking and everything else. And you're like, well, this, is, this, this isn't what I expected. Well, yeah, I know, but I, I was, I, I was, this is my first time. So we're good, right? So now Whoa. you have to go buy the, the other contractor to redo it all. <laughs> exactly, you know, and if you aren't willing to, you know, do it, don't, don't be upset that it doesn't work. And, you know, too many people think that it's easy. You know, I mean, it's, what do you need to use? It's going to take you more than five minutes. Well, the time I go research the tools, the work holder, uh, the tool holding, uh, how I'm going to put in the machine, how I'm going to mount it, how I'm going to approach it. Um, and I'm not your typical programmer. I'm very anal about my levels. I'm anal about my labels. I'm, I just don't, okay, here you I mean, it was my own shop. <laughs> I was making the parts you wouldn't understand half of what I did because I don't need to label it. Mm -hmm. But I learned a long time ago, it's not for me, it's for somebody else. So 
I label all my levels. I label my operations. I, I break things down. I try to make it, you know, you can't know what I'm thinking. So the, the file has to represent me and body and soul, so to speak. So you have to be able to kind of take it and own it. And I've seen a lot of contractors over the years where, you know, they do good work, but then their organization, their documentation, it's all, it's all junk. And it's like, look, man, that's as much a part of what we do as the file itself, the program itself. If, mm -hmm. if I'm not giving you EDP numbers for tooling, if I'm not giving you work holding, if I'm not, if I'm not breaking down and, and giving you a good setup sheet, I'm not giving you good images and I'm, you know, then I'm asking you to interpret. I want you to read my thoughts and understand my thinking without a way to decipher it. And, you know, that, that's just, it's just not, it's not conducive, but you know, people mm -hmm. do it all the time. So it's like, okay, whatever, you know, sure. Your prerogative, <laughs> but that's just not how I do things. Speaking of so, Mastercam, maybe we should uh, hop in and actually have a peek. So that wraps up the little interview portion of this talk with Ron. The next video will be part two of, of my talk with Ron. And that is where we get into the actual component he's made for us. And we'll get into tips and tricks and strategies inside of Mastercam in that video.